Today I'm going to be talking about The Sandman, Volume 2, The Doll's House, written by Neil Gaiman and illustrated by a whole bunch of people. This is Volume 2 of The Complete Sandman Library. These are a series of graphic novels which uh, collect the Sandman series, which originally ran as a series of comic books uh, published from the late 80s to the mid-90s, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, this volume uh, contains comics that were originally published in 1989 and 1990. They were published by DC Comics, uh, but they were part of the suggested for mature readers line of DC Comics. And we'll get around to talking about why that is in just a moment. But um, yeah, just, just in, in terms of classification. Uh, eventually, in 1993, DC Comics would launch Vertigo, which was their imprint for their mature reader um, comics. And when I say mature reader, I don't necessarily mean mature in the sense of more sophisticated. We just mean that the content is more edgy. Again, we'll get around to complaining about that in just a moment. Um, but yeah, uh, Vertigo launched in 1993, and when they launched, The Sandman was their flagship. It was their most popular comic at the time. But uh, when these originally came out in 1989 and 1990, it was slightly before Vertigo, so they were just DC Comics suggested for mature readers. Uh, I have already reviewed Volume 1, Preludes and Nocturnes on this channel, and I'll link to my review of that in the description down below. I reviewed it two years ago. Uh, I read it and reviewed it two years ago. So it's not quite as fresh in my memory as it could be. I feel like I remember some of it, most of it, not everything at this point. So uh, jumping into the doll's house two years later here. The reason for the two-year gap is at the time that I reviewed the first book, Preludes and Nocturnes, uh, that was the only Sandman volume that my library had at the time. Uh, however, I have since suggested to my library, my, this is the, the library at the school I'm working at, that they go ahead and order the second volume in the Sandman library because the data showed that the Sandman volume one was one of the most... Uh, read comic books in our library. And uh, I'm working on a project with my school library to try and get the students to read more uh, comics as part of a, a general project to try and get our students to read more in general, to just uh, increase their reading skills. I, I'm working at a school in Vietnam here where I, where I teach English as a second language. Um, when I reviewed Sandman Volume 1, I had some mixed feelings about the appropriacy of that book. Uh, but, you know, there was no culpability on my part. That book had been in my school library long before I got, I got there. Uh, this Volume 2, though, is one that I suggested to the library that they order. So I guess... Um, Anything inappropriate in this book is maybe I'm more culpable for that. Uh, although, I don't know. We'll, we'll get around to talking about this in a moment and, and we can, you, you can make up your own minds about, about how you feel about this. Am I being just overly sensitive or is this book, elements of this book, inappropriate? Um. As, uh, yeah, in, in my review of the first book in this series, I uh, gave uh, a, my usual long-winded rambling introduction, which I talked about my background to the Sandman series, the, the background being largely that I haven't read it. Uh, I was aware of Vertigo when I was reading DC Comics in the 1990s. I kind of viewed it, um, I, I wasn't terribly interested in reading at the time. Uh, I, I viewed it as um, needlessly just pushing boundaries for the 
sake of pushing boundaries, like being needlessly violent and grotesque just because it was cool to be like, uh, these are the comics that your parents don't, parents and teachers don't want you to read uh, type thing. Um, and, um, you know, I was from a conservative background, so maybe I was easily shocked or e easily um, offended. Uh, take me with a grain of salt, maybe. Um, but uh, just had no interest in reading it at the time. Um, since then, however, since the 90s, the, this series has only grown in stature and uh, legend. And everyone talks about how awesome Neil Gaiman is and how legendary his run on Sandman was. So I've been curious about it for quite some time before my school library uh, had it. Uh, sorry, before I found it in my school library, I should say. I, I gave a mixed review to Preludes and Nocturnes, um, as you'll see if you watch my review, but I also did say in that review that I was under the impression that based on what I read on Wikipedia and other places that the, the series had a reputation for uh, getting better as it went. So the, the first uh, one was um, the series just finding its feet. Um, and... The second one is, I think, better. I mean, take me with a grain of salt because it's been two years now since I read the first, um, first volume in this collection. But this, the second volume, I think, is, does have a tighter story arc. There's some interesting imaginative things going on in it. At the same time, I do feel like its uh, elements of it are needlessly dark and grotesque. So uh, let's talk about maybe what I like about it first. So the conceit behind the Sandman is the Sandman, or Morpheus as he is known, is the Lord of Dreams. He has been exiled from his realm for some 70 years or something because he was imprisoned by a mad magician. That all happened in volume one and is uh, recounted here in the prologue in, in case you forgot. And I was a little hazy on the details after two years. So it was nice to have Neil Gaiman catching me up to speed on the story. So the Sandman, uh, the plot of volume one was him reestablishing uh, his kingdom of dreams after having been gone for those 70 years. Uh, and that's where we still are a bit in volume two. So he's uh, having his servant Lucian do an audit and uh, he finds in the, the land of dreams there are four big ones unaccounted for. And these are Brute and Glob, the Corinthian, and Fiddler's Green. So the, these are creatures who belong to the land of green, uh, sorry, the land of dreams, who have escaped from the land of dreams and are out and about somewhere and need to be found. Uh, and... Um, that is what's going to happen in this volume. That, that's the plot, uh, so to speak, of this volume. Um, but there's also something else going on, which is Rose Walker, who uh, is um, having her own bizarre adventures, being reunited with her grandmother, as searching out her long-lost brother. And she is going to be the protagonist uh, against whose journey these other beings are going to appear either as uh, allies or adversaries in some ways. She also meets uh, the kindly ones. Now, uh, the kindly ones, according to Wikipedia, is a direct allusion to the Eumenides from uh, the Orestia in a uh, little crossover with my other reading. Uh, in my other reading, I'm, I'm currently reading uh, classical Greek and Roman tragedy, 
Uh, and as, as luck would have it, I'm actually in the middle of the Eumenides right now, um, which uh, Eumenides translates as the kindly ones, and that's the, the, the illusion Neil Gaiman is making here. Uh, although I, I have to admit, this would completely have passed me by if Wikipedia hadn't drawn my attention to it. I've, I've read the Wikipedia page uh, after I finished this volume. And perhaps as I go through, I'll be drawing from other little bits and tidbits uh, I learned from Wikipedia. Anyways, uh, so Rose Walker is in search of her brother. And her brother is in the land of dreams where there's a... Sandman and his wife, who are taking him on various adventures, at the same time, in real life, he is tied up and trapped in a basement where he's being tormented by rats. Um, so a little bit dark there, but it's going to get much darker still before this story is out. Uh, what we find out has happened um, is that uh, Brute and Gloop, uh, who, who were two of the creatures missing from Dreamland, uh, have set up their own land of dreams, uh, which when the Sandman finds out about it, he is furious. How dare they? How dare they? How dare they? Um, so uh, he moves in uh, to uh, this dreamland that Brute and Gloop have dreamed up. Now, Brute and Gloop have their own Sandman here that they've uh, set up, who we find out later is actually... Uh, a ghost, somebody who died in real life. Now, I didn't actually realize this until, again, I went to, went to Wikipedia, but this guy is Hector Hall, who's got a long history in DC Comics uh, and uh, various different incarnations. Um, and uh, was that's why he's a ghost. He was killed in the DC Comics continuity. And after the Sandman dispatches him, um, which he does, the, the Sandman is, is uh, like a god. I mean, he's not technically a god. He's one of the endless ones. Um, but he, he lacks, he, he's, he's like a deity in the sense that he, he seems to lack any human empathy. So he recognizes that this ghost is in the wrong place. Um, but he doesn't really have any, um, remorse about just sending him over to the land of the, get, the, the dead. Uh, you belong with the dead little ghost. Go to the place appointed for you and just rips him away from his wife, who's also with him in the land of dreams. Um... Much to her sorrow, uh, which is kind of a downer here. Uh, and, and you know, when you read it, when I read it, that was my takeaway. That's kind of a, a, a yeah, bummer note to end up on. Um, but again, I believe this is, uh, he's not actually gone. He's just off to his next incarnation, and he's going to pop up later in another DC comic. Uh, I, I guess this is uh, before, I think in the early days of the Sandman, it was much more tied to DC comic books continuity than the later days of the Sandman, is what I've been read to believe uh, through Wikipedia and other sources. Um, which, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a good thing Wikipedia is out there. 
Otherwise, I would have no idea who this Hector Hall guy is or what his story is or, or uh, why he's significant. Um, it would be interesting to read those other volumes um, where Hector Hall dies and how he ends up in Dreamland. Wikipedia gave me the impression that those stories are out there. They, they were just appearing in other titles in the DC universe. Um, and that's, I don't know, one of the frustrating things and the fascinating things about comic books. And I've, pardon me if you've heard me talk about this before on this channel, but I, I often talk about how I find comic books fascinating because it's not a linear narrative. It's narrative as a web of simultaneous stories going on um, at once and, and crisscrossing over with each other. But, uh, you know, it's one thing if you're reading them in real time when they're all there on the newsstand. But it's another thing if you're reading them 40 years later and uh, trying to track down where the rest of the story goes and uh, who's, who's uh, important and who's not and who's a crossover and who's not all those. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess to a certain extent that's, that's the way comic books go. But... Um, yeah, it, 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 does, it does lose something as time goes by. So the Sandman uh, is still collected in this volume, and the Sandman's complete run is co collected. But the, the various stories that he cross over with, um, good luck tracking those down. I mean, I, I guess they're all, this day and age, they're all on the internet somewhere, right? Um, so I guess at least there's that. Not legally on the internet, but they're, they're there. Um, but then, yeah. We get to the darker part of this, which is there's a serial killer's convention, um, which uh, our heroes our protagonists end up at where there's um, now, of course, the whole idea of a serial killers having a convention uh, is bizarre. Uh, but I guess that, that's just part of the part of the appeal is just how ridiculous it is. Um, but yeah. The, this is one of those things I I wanted to like this comic more because there were flashes of imagination and the, the idea of the dream world and these creatures escaping from dream world and the lord of the dream world and all that stuff. That that stuff I think it has an appeal to it. I, I, I could go along with that. But all this stuff about the serial killers, uh, and particularly, you know, when um, they turn out to be child molesters or child killers, as in this guy here, who's codenamed Funland. They all have their own code names. Um, that's unnecessary in, in my opinion. I, I don't think it adds any magic, uh, to the story. It doesn't make the story any more fun or more magical. Uh, I don't think it necessarily adds any depth to the story. We're not learning anything about the human condition. It's not a serious portrait of serial killers. Uh, it just strikes me again as uh, what my initial impression of Vertigo was from when I was a, a, a young teenager in the 1990s, which it was just edgelord stuff just for the sake of being edgelord. Like, we're going to do the dark stuff that your parents don't want you to read about uh, so that you can buy comics that say suggested for mature readers uh on them and just kind of marketing that to teens i don't know maybe, maybe there's 
a black humor in here that I'm not appreciating, but the... The idea of reading about these child molesters and child killers and, and these serial killers in general just made me feel dirty. Uh, like, you know, it makes me feel like I want to take a shower after reading this comic or um, certainly, certainly it spoils the magic for me. Uh, the, the, uh, whatever appeal I got from, uh, the magical lands of dreams and all the fantastic realities, that, that darker aspect of the story just sullied everything. Um, I'm belaboring the point, aren't I? I, I'm, I'm repeating the same thing over and over using different words, um, but yeah, that's that 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 that's my impression of this. Uh, some some really imaginative stuff and interesting stuff, but uh, seem to be dark and disturbing just for the sake of shock value, um, which which is a criticism I had uh, of the first volume as well. Um, and I'm not sure if I have anything much more to say other than that. Oh, okay. Maybe a couple more things to say. Uh, it's the first volume preludes and nocturnes was, um, a lot more episodic. Uh, this one is pretty much, uh, just one story with a couple standalone elements in here. So the first one uh, is a, a, a little kind of folk tale about how this glass city got destroyed. Uh, and um, I think it's just a standalone element, except this glass heart that they have here. Is that the same glass heart that shows up at the end. Sorry, let me find it. It's pink here. It was green before. It doesn't look exactly the same here. Um, is there a connection there? M maybe not, but they're both heart-shaped, right? Um, there's also uh, something here with desire. Uh, who has something to do with the plot of everything that is set in motion. Uh, and this is set up at the beginning, is largely forgotten about, or at least not talked about for most of the story, and then comes back around at the end. Um, but I don't quite understand what it was. Uh, what was Desire's plan? Uh, and it... Maybe, maybe I don't understand it because I was a little bit dense and I was missing something, or maybe I don't understand it because it... The Sandman himself doesn't understand it. And it was just never explained. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there is one more standalone story, um, which, again, uh, unless I'm missing something... Uh, doesn't connect with the other story. And this is about uh, a midnight man named Hobbes who decides that he doesn't want to die. Uh, and it starts off in the Middle Ages and uh, Neil Gaiman being an educated man, there are all sorts of references to history and literature. So uh, all I'm saying is when Ball and Tyler were killed, the spirit of the working man died with them. So, uh, not to pat myself on the back too much, but uh, I've read a couple of history books myself and recognize that is Ball, as in John Ball, who was like an early proto-communist, proto uh, who was one of the leaders of one of the peasant rebellions. Tyler, I think, is Watt Tyler, who... Ah, I forget which rebellion was Watt Tyler in. 
Um, sorry, I should have looked this up before filming the video. Um, but uh, th those uh, little details and details to famous authors and famous literary works are all throughout this. Again, uh, Neil Gaiman likes to, uh, he's a well-read man and he likes to drop in his illusions. Um, and this story is, uh, I think, just uh, a story, just a standalone story in, in the middle. Uh, doesn't, as far as I, unless I miss something, doesn't connect to anything else in this volume. I'm not sure if this character will pop up later in the Sandman series or not. Um, yeah. Oh, the, 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 the bird. According to Wikipedia, uh, the bird is, uh, they call him Matthew. Uh, he's uh, from the, the Swamp Thing or the Doom Patrol or uh, both comics. Uh, who died in the land of dreaming and so then becomes the Sandman's uh, servant. Now, I don't remember that from Preludes and Nocturnes, so maybe that's another thing that happened in a separate volume. It ha must have happened in the Swamp Thing volume or um, in the Doom Patrol volume. Either that or I just don't remember it. Okay, I think I've talked for long enough, so why don't I stop here?